it's a risk factor uh, for early death and other bad health outcomes in general. And with regard to COVID, we were talking about this as early as, like I said, April 21st, 2020. In our, in our ninth live stream, I went back and, and looked, assuming that my, my notes are complete. Um, I, I think we didn't talk about it before then, but we definitely talked about it then. Um, so I just before we talk about some of what is going on with children, I wanted to review some of what we know about obesity uh, in uh, with regard specifically to COVID. And in live stream number 69 on February 27th of this year, uh, we showed, oh, it's just showing me the wrong paper here. Um, actually, Zach, you can show this table briefly, and then maybe I'll just pull it back. Um, actually, apologies. Here's the paper. It's O'Hearn et al. Uh, 2021 called Coronavirus Disease 2019 Hospitalizations Attributable to Cardiometabolic Conditions in the United States, a Comparative Risk Assessment Analysis. If I may have my screen back here, I think I made some, here we go, just a couple of there. We're not going to go through the paper in depth. Again, we talked about this in episode 69. Um, they find, and you may show my screen here if you like, Zach, in the abst from the abstract. As of November, and this is published a while ago, so this is not up to date, um, but we see nothing to suggest that what they found has been um, overturned. As of November 18th, 2020, an estimated 906, 849 COVID-19 hospitalizations occurred in U.S. adults. Of these, an estimated 20.5% with 95% Uncertain, you know, I'm not going to focus on the numbers here. An estimated 20.5% of COVID-19 hospitalizations were attributable to diabetes mellitus, 30.2% to total obesity, uh, with that is to say body mass index over 30 kilograms per meter squared. There is a f relationship between over height, height. Yes, but meters squared sounds like an area, right? I don't think that's what they mean. I okay. think the formula <laughs> includes uh, the person's before. height squared somehow. But yeah, okay. So, what are the clinical implications of what they have found? Having found that found the top risks again were obesity, hypertension, and diabetes. They say clinicians should educate their patients who may be at risk and consider promoting preventative lifestyle measures such as improved dietary quality and physical activity to improve overall cardiometabolic health and potentially minimize the risk for coronavirus disease 2019 severity. Sounds like a good idea, does it not? Um, and finally, there's one more thing from this paper. In the most recent CDC um, analysis of available national data among individuals diagnosed with COVID-19, a 35-year-old with diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, or other chronic conditions had a similar risk of COVID-19-related hospitalization as a 75-year-old with none of these conditions and a similar risk of COVID-19-related death as a 65-year-old with none, a dramatic biologic aging effect of poor metabolic health on risk of severity of a viral infection such as COVID-19. So again, a 35-year-old with one of these prime comorbidities um, is in worse shape um, or as similar shape with regard to COVID risk as a 75-year-old with none of those risks. It's amazing. Which is, which is an extraordinary finding. So thank you, Zach. Given, um, given the steep aging curve of this disease. Yeah, because age is, a, is right. effectively it goes, a It goes from a trivial disease for yeah. very young, healthy people to a spectacularly dangerous disease. Well, spectacularly dangerous, a very dangerous disease yeah. uh, to elderly in elderly people. Exactly. And the fact that that... Um, you know, of course, of course, it's not that simple, but uh, the amount to which, to some degree, especially if you are currently healthy, staying healthy is relatively easy. And if you have one of these conditions, in so far as you can, in as much as possible, taking control of your own health and getting your weight down, getting your hypertension under control to some degree, um, can actually affect outcomes across across domains. And so we have also talked about, however, the fact that the clinical uh, suggestions here that health officials and doctors advise patients to, you know, to lose weight and to, to address the health conditions that they can actually control as opposed to, as opposed to simply relying on external sources of health, which is what the, the, the single-minded uh, public policy on dealing with COVID seems to be. Um, basically isn't happening. Now we did talk in um, a couple live streams ago in 107, I guess, about some uh, health advice that's coming out of Florida now. 
in which they're actually saying, go outside, get active, eat healthy, you know, move your body. And it sounds great, but it's literally the only one that I've found. I'm certainly not hearing anything like this at the federal level. And what we have seen is, and I'm going to just revisit since this is again from our ninth live stream, a piece that we saw in Wired and then one from the LA Times more recently uh, that, you know, what is the mainstream media doing with this kind of actual research results around comorbidities and COVID and how you can reduce your risk? Well, in um, April 17th, 2020, Wired published a piece called COVID-19 does not discriminate by body weight. The claim that those with higher BMIs are at special risk of dying from the coronavirus is gross, grossly overstated. Uh, and here very quickly, just Zach, show my screen uh, to, to demonstrate that this is, this is in fact what the, article, uh, what the article looks like. One of the things they said is obesity appears to be one of the biggest risk factors related to COVID-19 hospitalizations and critical illness, Newsweek claimed on Tuesday. Yet this rhetoric is based on flawed and limited evidence, which only exacerbates the stigma that larger bodied people already face in society and our healthcare system. The stigma is what truly jeopardizes their health, not weight itself. Wow. A fact that's only more important to consider in the midst of this pandemic. The stigma is what jeopardizes their health. And the article ends with this gem. Instead of trumpeting the supposed risks of high BMI and adding to the already damaging impact of weight stigma, researchers need to be asking deeper questions, and public health officials and journalists need to report on the science in more nuanced and sensitive ways. As of today, December 18th, 2021, there is neither a correction or a retraction anywhere associated with that article from Wired, which is from April 2020, at Follow. which point we already knew that obesity was a comorbidity, and we still know that. Follow the sensitive science. Follow the sensitive people and their feelings. There you go. Yeah. Well, that's really fascinating. And I must say, I do think that, uh, you know, BMI is a proxy for something. And, and it's it is, flawed. It's deeply flawed. Yep. But- it, you know, all else being equal, does BMI correlate with risk for COVID? It clearly does. It clearly does. Um, and so the question is, okay, you could add nuance to this, right? For one thing, BMI is such a crude measure in its formulation that you really don't know very much about, you know, whether someone is overweight or how overweight they are based on the simple measure, because there are body shape differences. And obviously, you know, somebody can have an awful lot of, uh, you know, muscle mass. There's a level at which that can become a, a hazard in and of itself. But basically, there's a lot of variation that isn't captured in this one measure. Right. But it's a, you know, it's a decent proxy. And it's in to the, you know, all of the sorts of measures that we take uh, erase a certain amount of nuance in sure. order to discover a pattern. And the point is, yes, you can also study the pieces of nuance and you get a diminishing returns pattern where, you know, BMI may explain the lion's share of the pattern and then you can recover other things from, uh, from different factors. But, but the idea that a high BMI can reverse the risk stratification for age Right. In COVID-19, that's incredible. It's a clear, it's a clear right. pattern, right? And the point is, it doesn't mean that an individual's BMI tells you anything because the individual could be a bodybuilder or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, but nonetheless, the pattern is there. And to deny it on the basis um that, you know, it causes stigma, which is the health concern, is obviously upside down and backwards. Right. And frankly, most individuals know this. You know, if if you're huffing and puffing after climbing one set of stairs somewhat slowly, uh, you're probably not in very good health. I mean, in fact, I don't know why I'm hedging with probably. I don't. I don't know the situation in which, if you're if you're short of breath after climbing one flight of stairs, I do not know the situation in which you are in peak health. Uh, it could be that you just have something temporary. It could be that uh, you climb the stairs too soon after having run five miles right? well, and that you're not back at baseline. But, uh, you know, we, we know this. And yes, there are people who have, you know, who, who weigh more than what the standard suggests they should who are healthy. Of course there are. Um, but that is not, there is so much evidence. There is so much evidence that obesity is a risk factor across many many health conditions and specifically for COVID. Well, I want to uh, push back there because I don't know what it's like to be 90. It's possible that a healthy 90 year old mm. might be huffing and puffing after a single flight of stairs. I, I just don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I won't say, you know, it's, there's no case, but yeah. the point is, you know, if you're 
40, 50, a single flight of stairs shouldn't throw you like that. And to the extent that it does, that's nature's way of telling you you need to build more capacity. Right. Um, so anyway, it's a minor pushback. But Yeah, no, I, I, I hear that. Um, let me – there's just another there, – there are a lot of these. But there's another amazing piece on obesity and COVID from the LA Times, which was published this year, not that recently, May 9th, 2021. Uh, it's called Fat Shaming, BMI, and Alienation, COVID-19 Brought New Stigma to large, sorry, Larger Sized People. No, Large Sized People. Uh, so you can, I'm going to read just the first short six paragraphs of this. And I, I do not know how to pronounce the names here. Uh, Crystal Bogon cried after the, ne- after the needle went into her arm. Not because her first dose of the Moderna vaccine hurt, but because finally being fat actually paid off. The 53-year-old was inoculated in the parking lot of Kaiser Permanente in San Jose on a rainy Friday in March, four days after eligibility in California was broadened to include people with underlying conditions, among them a body mass index of 40 or more, 233 pounds for an adult who is 5 feet 4 inches tall. Bogan's medical record at Kaiser shows she is morbidly obese. As an activist, she prefers the word fat. Her experience with medical providers has been one incident of size stigma after another, she said, like the time she went in with a scratched cornea and was told to lose weight. She fears being hospitalized with COVID-19 and unable to advocate for herself. For that reason, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to feel guilty about being vaccinated. I'm going to do it, she said, and I'm not going to apologize for it. I've been in fear the whole flipping time, staying home, avoiding everybody. I couldn't do my job. I'm an electrologist. I removed facial hair. I couldn't come to work. I couldn't make money. That, however, is changing. Thanks to a vial of vaccine, a very sharp needle, and a policy switch that allowed women and men like Bogan a chance to be inoculated before the general public in California about a month early. It's not every day that we get something for free because we're fat, said Bogan, who launched a YouTube channel called Fat Product Review. We'll stop there for now. Um, yeah, oh, go, go, ahead. Go, go for it. Well, I just, I just wanted to say a couple things. I mean, yeah. this, this story is layer upon layer of betrayal. Yes. Right. The idea that we are going to, at this stage, now champion obesity, obesity and portray this as the point at which it pays off is obviously absurd. But let's just say civilization has failed this person. Yes. Right. The epidemic of obesity is not about people not caring. People don't choose to be obese. Right. They can't control something. And the thing that they can't control is obviously in the realm of what we talk about in our book, hypernovelty, mm-hmm. right? This is not a genetic defect. This is something about our ancient selves encountering a modern world in which there are there is a factor or there are a number of factors that combine to cause that system to get out of whack. And we ought to be, if, you know, I mean, this is uh, increasingly um, glaring, but we have public health officials that are apparently willing to turn civilization absolutely upside down and to withdraw all sorts of fundamental rights in order to advance a one size fits all policy that is clearly not based in science. Mm-hmm. And yet, there is no interest whatsoever. They're obsessed with our health as long as the topic is this narrow focus and the solution in question is the only one that they allow us to discuss, right? They're obsessed with our health in that case. But and, gives a, and provides no agency for us. No agency. In fact, the point is actually there are things you can do to protect yourself from COVID and they're specifically not advising them, right? Mm-hmm. They're not advising us to take vitamin D. They're not advising people, hey, this would be a great moment. In fact, you know what there is at the moment with respect to getting your weight under control, extra reason to motivate, right? There's a disease out there and it will afflict you worse. So, hey, if you needed a little extra push in that direction, here it is. Are they saying that? No, they're saying, you know, embrace your high BMI, right? That yep. makes no sense. And, and, and some people are saying talking about high BMI being a risk factor is itself a form of fat shaming and that it's not the high BMI, it's the stigma that's making people sick. And no, no, it's it's not. And again, as you say, that's not to say that there isn't stigma and that's not to say that, you know, especially, especially for people um, who became fat as children, there are, there are in many cases developmental processes which cannot be undone such that people will be you know, chronically struggling to get their weight under control and it really is not um, easy for them to the extent that it's easy for anyone who gains 10 or 20 pounds to lose it. It's not the same problem. It right. is not the same problem. This isn't a simple thing. Just like BMI is a flawed and overly simplistic rubric, it's not, you know, 
calories in, calories spent. It's not that simple an equation that actually doesn't work. It depends on you know what it is that you're eating, under what conditions, what else you're doing with your life, and also what your history looks like. And you cannot change that. What's done is done. Right, and of course, you know we are creating the problem. You know, one of the the puzzles that we run into with all sorts of things, whether it's uh, the need for glasses, the need for orthodontia, or, uh, you know, a, a lifelong battle with, with obesity, all of these things are the result of some influence, right? Yeah. An influence that even if we can't help people who are already afflicted, we can prevent it from afflicting anybody else, right? If you figure out why it is that kids suddenly need orthodontia and you stop doing that thing to them, exactly. then you don't need any more orthodontia for younger people. And you just have to deal with the people who already have the issue. And the point is, were these people at all interested in our health? They would be focused on yes. years of life that people are being robbed of by conditions. Yes. They would be focused on quality of life being lost. And there would be some sort of rational formula that says we should prioritize this thing because it is robbing people of the most quality or uh, years of life. Mm -hmm. And we're obviously not doing that. You know, in fact, even the way we calculate the harm of COVID is absurd, mm -hmm. right? Because the point is the damage done to young people is vastly more important than damage done to the very old just by virtue of the number of years of theirs that you compromise. And so the idea that, you know, vaccines good is n nonsense right? Because the point is who you're giving them to and how much they stand to benefit versus lose is not the same parameter. And yet we pretend that it is so that we can get one number. And mm -hmm. um, at some level, I think we have to call their bluff. They're obviously not interested in our health. I don't know why they are interested in what they're interested in. It could be that it's money. It could be that it's something else. But for God's sake, it's clear that their obsession, their um, the appearance that they are obsessed with our well-being relative to COVID is not uh, real because if it was, they'd be obsessed with our health on other topics too, and they clearly aren't. 